greater love has no one than this. By Byung Un Yu. Part 2 The Love That Is Wide, Great, High, and Deep. The Bible addresses each one of us when it says, And you he made alive who were dead. But, you might say, I have never died or been made alive again. Even though you have simply continued to live and breathe from the day you were born into this world until now, the Bible says, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. This point is made very clear, but how did this happen? And what are these words trying to tell us? As we read through the Bible carefully, we soon come to Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. There we find the words that God spoke very early on to Adam, the forefather of all mankind. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Even so, Adam did eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thus becoming a sinner and the forefather of sinners, since he caused all of mankind to inherit this sin. At that time, even though outwardly Adam was living and breathing, he was in a spiritually dead state in God's eyes. In this sense, he was dead in trespasses and sins. As a result of Adam's mistake, we too, as descendants of this man who ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, are condemned to live lives that are full of sins and misdeeds. So the Apostle Peter wrote, From your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. And the Apostle Paul wrote, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. Paul explained that all people came under condemnation through this one sin. If this is true, I cannot help but acknowledge as fact that I too was undoubtedly born a sinner and, like Adam, was spiritually dead. In the New Testament, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1-3, to 3, it says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. This passage clearly indicates the captive state of our minds as we live in this world. This is truly the way it is. Since we were dead in our trespasses and sins, we were by nature the children of wrath. If this is the case, and we are clearly aware of this fact, we cannot just sit still and do nothing in the midst of such wrath. Now, therefore, each of us needs to examine his or her heart in the light of the mirror that we call the Bible. Just as we examine our faces as they are reflected in a mirror, we need to examine each of our thoughts carefully, one by one. First of all, let's read from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17, verses 9 and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. If we consider these words carefully, we find ourselves looking back over our past lives, and we cannot help but acknowledge the existence of the sinful nature within us that causes us to commit sins, knowingly or unknowingly. There will probably be people who comfort themselves with the thought that they have relatively few sins, since they have only entertained them in their minds and have not transferred them into actions. The Bible tells us, however, that even though you may not actually have committed a sinful act, if in your heart you have felt hatred towards another person, or perhaps even wanted to kill them, that amounts to the same thing as murder. Also, even though you may not have actually committed adultery, entertaining lustful thoughts in itself is also judged as adultery. Since this is the case, who among us could dare claim to have no sin? When we read Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 and 22, and verses 27 to 30, 
we cannot possibly deny the existence of the sinful nature squirming around in our hearts and in our thoughts. You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, You fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Verses 18 and 19 of Ephesians chapter 4 speak of our sinful nature, saying, Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness, in the light of this passage, probably no one will be able to deny that we have all harbored this sinful nature like a hereditary disease throughout our lives. The difference between the inner sins of our hearts and the sins that are manifested in our actions is related to the severity of the sins. Even though we live our lives tending towards wickedness, greed, envy, strife, malice, spite, pride, and gossip, these tendencies have been well smoothed out by upbringing, education, or religious good deeds, and therefore we may appear to be very righteous in the eyes of others. Nevertheless, in the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah chapter 64 verse 6 says, But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. This is truly the way it is. Man's righteous acts are like filthy rags. Even if we follow the law, we are still nothing but sinners before God. In Romans chapter 3, verse 20, it says, Therefore by the deeds of the law no flesh will be justified in his sight. Also, there are people who are often troubled by a guilty conscience, even though they are not zealous in any religious sense and have no knowledge of the law of the Bible. Such people will have a better understanding of this matter if they read Romans chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. This happens because God has lit a lamp within man's heart. The Bible says this lamp is the spirit of man. The spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inner depths of his heart. God first gave the Bible to all of mankind in order to save our spirits. If we continue to carry this great burden of sin until we die, we will definitely come under God's judgment. But God took pity on us and sent His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to receive the judgment in our place. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. But this man, Christ, after He had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, for by one offering He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Then He adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now, where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17 through 18. If you think about these verses, you will be able to see that the death of Jesus Christ was clearly the love of God that provides forgiveness of sins and the way of the eternal salvation that God gives free of charge. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. God also said He would no longer remember our sins and lawless deeds. Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. 
And God has made it clear that, where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. This sacrifice, Christ's death on the cross, was not like the sacrifices that the Jews offered every year. It was an eternal sacrifice offered once for all. Therefore, long before Jesus was born into this world in human form, in other words, before the Word was made flesh and appeared before man, God said through the prophet, Then I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. Then, much later, it was written, Once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, and, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified, every one of us is a sinner from the day we are born until the day we die. Since we are sinners, we cannot help but commit sins. God, however, does not just see the sins of the sinner. In order that his ever-loving gaze might fall once more upon the sinner himself, he delivered up his Son to be crucified, thus covering our filthy, hateful sin with the blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, from God's point of view, your sins, my sins, and the sins of everyone have all been completely forgiven. In regard to this matter, God said, I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. What else could this verse be referring to other than Christ's death on the cross? Not one of us was born a sinner because we wanted it to be so. It is simply that the moment our forefather Adam ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he became a sinner, and we, having inherited the nature of sin that has been passed down to us, are sinners from the moment we are born. Since everyone is born as a sinner in this way, God has declared, There is none righteous, no, not one. Since we have become sinners, not because of something we have done, but because of Adam, God did not want us to pay the price for our sins ourselves. This is why God removed all the sin of the whole world in one day through the crucifixion of His only begotten Son. Bearing the sins of the whole world, Jesus Christ offered Himself on the cross once for all in accordance with God's holy will. As He was breathing His last, His final words were, it is finished. He was saying that the will of God to provide forgiveness for the sins of all the people in the world, once for all, had been accomplished. Therefore, it is only right that we should let go of the pangs of our consciences that worry and torment us and accept this tremendous love of God, entrusting ourselves entirely to Him. If we do this, our hearts will become much lighter and happier. If, however, we do not believe this truth entirely and continue to have doubts, we are committing the sin of refusing the love of God, the love that brings pardon for our sins through the cross on which Christ paid the huge price. As a result, we disappoint Him all the more. God said, But you have burdened me with your sins, you have wearied me with your iniquities. Nevertheless, God has mercy on us and says, I. Even I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. He also said, For they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Each one of us needs to understand that God has already forgiven all of our sins and is calling us to believe. In Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18, God says, Come now, and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 22, God speaks of the work He has accomplished, saying, I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions, and like a cloud your sins. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. If there is anyone who is still burdened by his sin and continues to be troubled by the pangs of his conscience, even though God has spoken to us like this with all earnestness, I would urge that person to turn immediately to Isaiah chapter 38 verse 17 and read what it says.
Indeed, it was for my own peace that I had great bitterness. But you have lovingly delivered my soul from the pit of corruption, for you have cast all my sins behind your back. What tremendous blessings these words contain! If the sin of each one of us had not been forgiven in this way, how could we ever have been forgiven? I am reminded of the words of a hymn I learned when I was only a young child. Weeping will not save me, though my face were bathed in tears, that could not allay my fears, could not wash the sins of years. Weeping will not save me, working will not save me, purest deeds that I can do, holiest thoughts and feelings too, cannot form my soul anew. Working will not save me, waiting will not save me. Helpless, guilty, lost, I lie. In my ear is mercy's cry. If I wait, I can but die. Waiting will not save me. But then it says, Faith in Christ will save me. Let me trust thy weeping son. Trust the work that he has done. To his arms, Lord, help me run. Faith in Christ will save me. To the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He has made us accepted in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Not only did Jesus take my sins upon Himself, but He also died in my place. If we have this personal assurance that through his death we as individuals also died, and through his resurrection we also live with him, we really cannot help but praise God. In Romans chapter 6 verses 10 and 11 it says, For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We were dead in trespasses and sins, but now we cannot help but praise God day by day because He has made us alive through Jesus Christ who died for us. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It is not through our own efforts to believe that this fact is accomplished within us. Faith just comes to us. Such is the experience of true faith, revealed through the Holy Spirit of God when we accept the love of God that is freely given and receive His Son, Jesus Christ, as Lord in our spirits. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. This is true. Salvation is purely God-given grace. It is not received through good deeds or efforts. Salvation is free of charge. There is no price to pay. It is simply a case of being thankful for the love by which the only begotten Son of God took all your sins upon Himself as He was crucified, shed His blood, and died. Such simplicity that allows a person just to believe unconditionally brings about the kind of faith that is acceptable in God's eyes. A baby does not exert itself in any way in order to be born and become a child in the family. The right to become a child of God is given in the same way. In James chapter 1, verse 18, it says, Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Your spirit has been born into this world clothed in flesh in order that it might be born a second time before God through the Holy Spirit. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God which lives and abides forever. In this way, we are born and live our lives as descendants of Adam and, therefore, as sinners, but now we have been saved from sin by the grace that God bestows. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. 
The grace that we receive free of charge like this is God's gift, and a gift requires no payment. If we could become righteous by performing good deeds, paying the price ourselves, or adhering strictly to the law, there is no way that that could be considered grace. If we were made righteous by the law, Christ would have died in vain. This righteousness of God is absolute. So what happens when another kind of righteousness, in other words, man's store of good deeds accomplished by his own efforts, is given more importance than God's righteousness? In Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, it says, All our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. Also, in Job chapter 35, verse 8, it says, And your righteousness may profit a son of man. Through the law we realize that we are sinners before God, and it is inevitable that we should discover that we are lost and we can do nothing but ask God to forgive us. In this way, we come to know God's purpose in giving us the law. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. Early on, Jesus said, For I say to you, that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. From these words, we can see that any religious zeal we may have today as we live in our present age is weak beyond comparison when we consider the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees living at the time of Jesus. If this is the case, there is no way that we can go to heaven by our own strength. So God made the way wide open for us through Jesus Christ. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's right. There is only this one way. There is only this one new and living way that God opened through the death of His Son, Jesus Christ. In the past, we too were all sinners, ignorant of this path and wandering lost. We were like wandering sheep that had lost their way. So, as Jesus was first preaching the gospel to the Jews, He said, and other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Jesus died for sinners who are wandering lost, including Gentile sinners such as we are. It is just as Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And as it says elsewhere in the Bible, who Jesus himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, and who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. If you have definitely come to believe the truths contained in these words and all your doubts have disappeared, you will find you cannot help but praise the great love that God the Father has bestowed upon us. In the Bible, it says that now there is no one who can condemn me or you or any of us. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Thus the Holy Spirit of God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead has brought each of us individually to believe this gospel in our hearts, and we have been justified freely. Therefore, this truth becomes a definite experience of forgiveness of sins for each individual, and having found this forgiveness, we enjoy peace in our hearts. It was ordained long ago that this should be accomplished for the praise of God's glory. This people I have formed for myself. They shall declare my praise. Amen.